Hello everyone, my name is Lewis Leonard and I'm an application engineer for Rival Medical. Uh, this presentation today um, has been developed to educate biomedical and clinical professionals um, as an introduction um, and overview to electrosurgery. Um, so firstly, um, we'll go over the um, introduction to our company um, and we'll talk about ESU waveforms um, and their effects. Um, and the final part of the presentation is to help understand the, the hazards of electrosurgery um, and what preventive measurements um, are used to reduce that risk. And then in the final part of the presentation, we talk about performance testing um, and any questions you might have. Um, there is a handout of these slides. Uh, you should be able to find it in the GoToWebinar um, box at the bottom. Um, so it should be a copy of an introduction to electrosurgery um, PDF. So if you need a copy of the slide, it's available there. Uh, but let me know if you can't find it. Um, and we'll um, try and sort that out at the end. Okay, so firstly, a little bit about ourselves at Rival Medical. We are renowned globally as a designer and manufacturer of reliable, portable and compact biomedical test equipment. Our reputation has emerged from our 38 plus years um, of experience. Um, our products ensure that critical medical equipment is safe to use um, throughout the device's life cycle. Um, as metrology specialists for almost four decades, our innovative testing solutions have been mitigating risk worldwide in healthcare environments. Um, so we have um, over 40 distribution partners um, covering 110 countries um, with seven um, RIGEL authorised global service centres. Um, and then our manufacturing site and main office is based in Peterlee, the UK. Um, but we also have a US office uh, which is based in Tampa, Florida, uh, headed up by Paul Fopel. So we'll start with electrosurgical generators. Um, actually, before I get started, um, I'm just going to do a quick poll to see if anyone wants any um, CPD certificates um, before I forget. Um, so if I just launch that now, because some of you might not have got this until after the registration. Um, so I'm just want to find out your feedback um, in case you didn't get this option when you registered. I'll just give you a minute to fill that out. Okay, perfect. I think most of you have voted. Thank you. Um, so now we can start on the presentation. Sorry about that. Um, so electrosurgical generators, ESUs, um, are crucial pieces of equipment uh, and they're used in the majority of operative settings. Um, so they're one of the most you know, useful um, and common instruments used by surgeons. So they're used in 85% of all surgical operations. But despite uh, modern ESUs being typically safe, electrical hazards are still present to the patient and user. Uh, such as burns, um, fire and smoke. Our burns alone account for up to 40,000 injuries per year worldwide. So the principle of, of heat production um, is via current passing into the tissue at the point of application. Um, now there's, there's a number of different effects that uh, electrosurgery can produce. Uh, such as coagulation, uh, cutting, uh, desiccation um, and fulguration. Um, now, ESUs can be, so the application of ESUs can be summarised by Joule's law of heat. Um, so heat equals current squared, so this is the, the high frequency ESU output, um, times by resistance, which is the human uh, tissue, uh, which provides the resistance to the current, um, time, time, so application duration, um, the application duration of the ESU output. Um, and this relates to the duty cycle, um, which we'll come on to um, shortly. And ESU is often referred to as the diathermy. Uh, this means heating through um, from the Greek words dia, meaning through, and thermi, meaning heat. 
So electrosurgery is based on the transformation of high frequency current energy into heat energy. Um, and why do we use high frequency energy? Well, it's above, well above the threshold of depolarization of 10 kilohertz. Um, now, st standard mains frequency is 50 or 60 hertz um, throughout most of the world. Um, this relatively low frequency uh, current can be felt by the body. Um, this can lead to possible complications um, such as muscle spasms, um, cardiac arrest, or um, heart arrhythmias. Um, so, with electrosurgery being a 500 kilohertz and above, um, these, this does not affect um, any susceptible tissue and this therefore eliminates the possibility of any neuromuscular um, and cardiac interference. Um, the higher frequencies also eliminate the risk of um, any type of electrocution from that. So we'll talk about cardiac arrest. Um, electrocution will not occur, but a hazard still occur here in that burns um, are present. However, electrocution can still occur um, if the ESU is factored as unsafe. Um, if it's electrically um, unsafe and it's, it's running on mains electricity still, um, so there still is a risk from an ESU um, causing electrocution. Um, but returning to the application of electrosurgery, body tissue is included um, in an electrical um, circuit, so the electrosurgery electrical circuit. It's the biological tissue that provides the impedance to this high frequency current, and that's what produces uh, the required heat. Okay, so electrocauterization um, originated before electrosurgery. Um, it was developed by using direct electrical current to heat a wire and cauterized tissue. Um, cauterization itself has been used for centuries um, where heated tools have been used. Um, you may have seen on, on TV or um, films where they actually use uh, heated swords or other types of tools to, to stem bleeding, um, get rid of abscesses, um, and this by producing hemostasis. Um, so electrocautery is based on that principle of thermal application. Um, but it's important to note that electrocautery is a completely different concept um, to electrosurgery. Electrocautery generates heat by passing current through a wire. Um, so the heat is produced at the probe itself. Um, electrosurgery generates heat by passing current um, through body tissue via two electrodes. Um, so it's the body's resistance to that current that generates the heat. So what are electrosurgical units? Um, how do they work? What are the different applications and techniques? Um, and how do they produce um, varying um, um, tissue effects? Sorry, one second, I've got a question. I've just had a query um, regarding having no audio. Could someone else confirm if they're getting any audio through? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we are getting some audio on there. Um, hopefully they can resolve um, the issue they have at their end. Um, but no, Mike seems to be okay at my end. Um, so anyway, they produce uh, varying tissue effects um, and also we're going to take a look at the advantages um, of ESUs and why it's used over other methods. Or if anyone's having any audio trouble, someone's just mentioned that they need to select computer audio or call in um, and that should resolve the issue. So thank you for that. Bit of advice there coming through. Um, so ESUs are ideal pieces of equipment for surgeons. Um, they reduce surgery times with minimal blood loss. Uh, this is thanks to um, coagulation and different cutting techniques. Um, in, in a lot of modern technologies, they're using um, ESUs now in surgical robots. Um, so 
because ESUs are so uh, versatile, um, they're actually being utilised in this way and very useful. A variety of waveforms can be reduced by an ESU. Um, cut, which is for cutting tissue. Uh, coagulation, um, used to stem bleeding. And then we've got blends, which are a combination of both of these applications. And the way it does this, we'll come on to shortly. Um, why, are, why are blends so important? Well, it's useful for, for cutting in areas where you might find higher blood loss. Um, so you might have a, a high density of blood vessels in certain areas of the body. Um, and this is where uh, blends really come into their own. Um, so with the correct technique, some surgeons can cut using coag and co coag using cut. Um, the reason some surgeons would like to do this is it can be quite ineffective to keep switching modes um, as a surgeon. So with enough experience, uh, one mode can be sufficient. An ESU relies on its three primary functions. So it's transforming mains low AC currents, 50 or 60 Hertz to higher frequency currents. It relies on varying the output power, the wattage. Uh, the reason for this is that ESUs um, have different, sorry, tissue has different impedances. So local tissue uh, can even have variation. So scar tissue, um, fat and scar tissue, being in close proximity to muscle, um, where they have very different um, types of impedances. So muscle has much lower impedance than fat and scar tissue. Um, however, some modern ESUs can actually maintain constant power despite this impedance. Um, adjusting the duty cycle, this is just the on and off operation, um, typically in seconds with a percentage. Um, so for example, if I don't say five seconds at 50 hertz, a 50% duty cycle uh, would simply mean five seconds on uh, and five seconds off during operation. Um, an ESU is controlled using either a foot switch or a switch on the handpiece. Um, there are normally yellow or blue controls um, which signify cut and coag respectively. So much like shown in this diagram, um, yellow for cut and cut for coag find these switches um, on the hand pieces or foot switch. Um, it's as a safety measure, the ESU switch must always be pressed down um, continuously. Uh, now, most modern day ESUs are isolated generous, generators. Um, so what exactly does that mean? Um, well, ESUs used to be uh, ground referenced um, where the electrical current would pass through the patient's body and then it would return um, to ground. Now the grounding is intended to occur via the patient electrode here, patient return electrode, which is usually situated uh, somewhere like the thigh. Um, however, electrical currents like to seek alternative paths to earth. They wanna look at the easiest way um, back to earth, as we know from um, electrical terms. Um, so this could be any conductive point. Um, it could be an ECG placement on here. It could be the bed as shown on this diagram. It's an earthing point. Um, and this increases the po possibility of creating alternative site burns um, on the patient. Um, good thing is many ma manufacturers don't rely on ground reference DSUs anymore um, due to this high risk. Um, and these are typically now isolate generators where current uh, must return through the return electrode back to the generator. Um, so this mon this actually depicts a monopolar circuit um, where the current flows through the human body. Um, it's different to bipolar, we'll come on to that. In the bipolar system, current flows from one um, tie into the other through tissue held between the forceps. Uh, so a typical circuit is composed of the ESU, um, the active electrode and the return electrode. Um, the active and return electrode placement depend on whether bipolar or monopolar. Um, so we talk about electrical circuits. Um, so if, if we were to explain this in electrical terms for anyone that's more familiar with um, any sort of electrical circuits, then current enters the human body because it's part of the circuit. 
Um, the biological tissue is what provides the impedance. Um, and then this results, this is what results in uh, the heat production as the electrons try to overcome uh, the resistance in the body. Monopolar electrosurgery is the most common. Um, something I actually learned recently is that bipolar is actually more common in neonatal surgeries. Um, I wasn't aware of that. Um, it's to do with the fact that neonates don't have um, a wide surface area for the patient return electrode. Um, the bodies are much smaller. Um, but in general, this is the most common. Um, now, numerous modalities, including cut, blend, desiccation, uh, and fulguration, can be used with monopolar. Um, repeat this a bit, but a patient's body completes the circuit. Um, the active electrode is at the surgical site. This is represented by a small um, probe, small singe probe. Um, high current density at the tip produces intense heat. For instance, a needle tip has the highest density of current. Um, and the patient return electrode, this has the lowest density of current. So the return electrode needs to be um, attached distal from the surgical site. Um, so why is this situated far from, from the patient? So we, if we imagine where the wave current is flowing, so we use the needle tip, for example, um, if this was, um, say, for instance, this was the patient's body, the current is trying to flow to the patient return electrode. Now, if it was placed like this next to the site of surgery, all the current is going to flow to this point here, looking for the easiest way back to earth. Um, so it's all going to flow here and you're going to get high density current and a lot of heat. Um, and this is where burns can occur. If the patient plate is sighted distal from the surgical site, then the current is going to be um, well dispersed. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. It's, it's dispersed through the body um, without um, too much uh, heat being created at the site. So bipolar electrosurgery is performed at the surgical site um, by both the active and return electrodes, um, usually represented by the forceps. Now the tissue between the electrodes completes the circuit. So current, the current path is achieved at the surgical site. Um, it typically uses lower voltages than monopolar, um, so less energy is required. It does, uh, however, have limited ability, so ability to cut and coag um, compared to uh, monopolar. So you're limited to this small area um, where you can grab it between the forceps. Um, so obviously there's no patient return electrode required in this setup. Um, it's just the current is flowing through the forcep, through one forcep, um, through it via the tissue there and then back um, with the return. Um, and then one thing we like to mention is that the return electrode um, is to help surgeons, um, it assists surgeons in the terms. It can be misleading to engineers because we've got an active and return electrode that suggests um, that we've got a DC circuit, um, but we know that's not the case. It's high frequency AC. Um, these actual terms are just to assist the, um, the surgeons. Okay, so ESUs can be programmed um, uh, to function in several different modes with different waveforms and distinct tissue characteristics. Um, under, so the understanding the waveforms and tissue effects is critical um, in reducing any complications and hazards. The, the generate output can be varied in two ways. So the, the voltage um, can be altered to drive more or less current through the tissue. Um, or the waveform can be modified um, to produce different tissue effects like shown here. So very um, different waveforms produced. Now, coagulation currents are intermittent bursts of dampened sine waves. Um, so this is where tissue is allowed to cool between um, each sine wave. Um, and a blended current is a modification of the duty cycle um, and operates the voltages between those of cutting and coagulation. And I did miss out cutting there. Cutting is an uninterrupted, um, pure sinusoidal waveform 
with high average power and current density, there's no time for cooling. Okay, so cutting currents, um, single frequency, continuous waveform. Um, the use of electrical sparks allows for precise cutting um, and focused heat, um, which minimizes widespread thermal damage, um, but while vaporizing the tissue. Now in cutting, the, 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 the electrode should be held away from the tissue to produce a spark gap. Um, and then the discharge arc um, at specific locations will produce the localized heating effect um, over a very short period of time. Um, and what this leads is this leads to high levels of heating, um, extreme um, levels of heat, and this vaporizes um, the cells and the intracellular fluid. Now, a fine clean incision is created through the biological tissue, um, and it's with minor coagulation or hemostasis. Um, so there's there's little uh, external thermal damage; it's localized. Um, but the the the, uh, the continuous current doesn't allow for any tissue to cool in that area. And now coagulation currents are characterized by um, high voltage intermittent bursts, um, as shown here. Um, relatively low current. Um, you've got a six percent on and ninety five percent off. So you've got this period here, um, which allows for cooling and blood sealing. Um, now, coagulation is electrical sparking over a wide area, and therefore there's less heat that's produced. Um, it results in uh, low, like slow dehydration, evaporation, um, and this is what seals the blood vessels um, while still keeping some um, sort of um, cells, still, still keeping the cells intact. Um, so the, the coagulation current is operated um, typically between uh, 30 and 50 watts um, and voltage spikes can be up to 9 or 10 kV. Um, desiccation um, is a direct contact form of coagulation where 100% of the electrical energy is converted into heat. Um, it's over a broad area and this is what causes the dehydration of the cells in the tissue. And fulguration is a non-contact form of coagulation. Um, and it produces a spark gap and electrical discharge arc to mediate the tissue as the air between the probe um, and the tissue ionizes. Um, and this causes a spray effect at various regions um, and it produces uh, shallow tissue destruction. There's some good images on fulguration. Um, if you go on Google, you'll see how it works. You've got the spark gap in it and it spreads out um, over, the, over a wide surface area in the tissue. It's good. For, graphical representation of what's going on. Um, so blended currents, these are um, a modification of the duty cycle. So you've got three different blends here, um, different types between cut and coag. Blended currents allow for tissue division, but they maintain the variable degree of hemostasis. Um, and this hemostasis is by the off period. Um, so here we've got we're closer to coag and here we're closer to cut. Um, now the, the, volt, the ratio of voltage and current is adjusted to increase hemostasis. Um, and the modifications and reductions to the duty cycle um, produce less heat um, and interval bursts. Um, and as they progressively increase, the greater coagulation um, is produced. Um, now, these are ideal for surgeons cutting through tissue whilst coagulating small blood vessels, um, reducing blood loss. So what are the ESU hazards? Um, if electrosurgical use is carried out improperly, um, this can expose not just the patient, but also um, the staff to several hazards um, and includes burns. Uh, smoke and electrocution. Electrical current always poses a risk. Um, an ESU circuit needs to be closed um, for electricity to flow. And therefore, current has the potential um, to travel along these pathways of uh, least resistance. 
Um, and this is where we get our undesired effects, um, such as electric shock and skin burns. Um, ESUs can cause burns at the intended surgical site, um, at, but also at alternate sites and the return electrode. Um, the patient return electrode is a common site of injury. Um, now, this can be caused by insufficient size to safely disperse the current, or if it's interrupted, um, so if the patient plate is removed or um, comes loose. And this, this reduces the contact with the patient, um, and this is what can result in um, burns. So, high frequency currents have a tendency to stray, and this can lead to potential burns away from the surgical site. Um, so, the, these leakage currents, we call them, um, are more likely to cause burns localized. And um, so, any burn, what what can happen is um, it can form um, capacitive leakage, and the the capacitive leakage can um, affect tissue um, that's close to the surgical site, but not not supposed to be um, in contact. Um, current can also divert through an alternative earthing point. And this can cause accidental burning elsewhere on the body. Um, to avoid this, the patient should not touch any metal object. Um, and is usually placed on insulated materials, um, such as um, an insulated mattress, and this helps to isolate the patient. Um, surgical smoke is produced as the tissue is heated and vaporised. Um, this can contain potentially harmful chemicals. Um, smoke evacuation uh, chambers um, are help, designed to help minimise this. In addition to this, um, surgeons wear filtration masks as well, um, purely for this reason. Um, and with electrosurgery, there's two different types of smoke, and it relates to the rise in temperature. So any any quick rise in temperature, um, the smoke that produces is what can lead to um, carcinogens in the air. Um, whereas the lower the, the lower rises in temperature, this is what can release um, bacteria, um, drug resistant bacteria into the air um, and also cells from the body. So this is where uh, there's an infection risk. Um, ESUs are also the most common source of ignition in operating fires and explosions. Um, alcohol based skin preparation uh, should be avoided uh, because liquid can pool under surgical towels. Um, and it's the active electrode which can ignite this and this is where high frequency leakage comes in. Um, electrode surgical sparks can also ignite flammable gases within body cavities. Um, some pretty gruesome photos online where, where gases can pull within the chest um, and it's the electrosurgery sparks which can cause that. Um, it's commonly taught in electrosurgery. Case of performance and safety of electrosurgical devices. Um, so we're going to focus on performance testing, but it's also safety um, because you've got high frequency leakage testing, which is a form of safety testing, and it's quoted in the standard. Um, and it must be regularly verified um, to help mitigate some of these risks we've just been talking about, um, in particular in relation to burns um, and electrocution. It's a design criteria. Um, ESU manufacturers must adhere to strict design conditions in IEC 60601. It ensures that ESUs are safe to use for the operator and patient. Um, regular performance and safety testing is required. Um, that, that should be performance and safety testing required at regular intervals. Um, don't have to regular twice. Um, typically every six to 12 months. Um, testing typically includes uh, your visual checks. Um, we've got further guidance on visual checks in part of our electrical safety webinar series. Um, so please sign up to that if you want to find out more about electrical safety. Um, same goes for safety tests. Um, but this, these types of safety tests um, referenced in this um, bullet points are the low frequency electrical safety tests, typically 50, 60 hertz, um, up to one kilohertz. 
again, we go into much more detail in our safety webinars. And we've also got uh, guidance booklets for 60601 and 62353, um, and they're available for download from our website, um, ragamedical.com. And then we've got performance tests. Um, and these can be broken down into individual function. Now, within performance tests, we've actually got some safety tests, high frequency ones. Um, so, first, we've got verification of return patient electrode monitoring. Um, this is also sometimes known as CQM, contact quality monitoring. You've got ARM as well. There's there's a few different um, names for it. Um, it's essentially the same thing. It's different manufacturers, um, and it's region specific as well. I believe in the US they use CQM more commonly. Um, I'm not too sure. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to post a poll um, regarding this um, to see what's um, the most popular. Just launch that. See what's most commonly used. Okay, so I'm seeing REM still the most popular. Um, I ran this poll this morning as well. Okay, thank you guys. That's most of you voted. Um, back to performance testing, um, going on to high frequency leakage testing, um, and then we've got output power measurements. So checking the the output power um, at certain loads in relation to the, the function and the waveform selection. It's important to note as well, because high frequency leakage testing um, is related to safety testing, um, this is often shown in the um, this is followed by in the standard, not in the manufacturer recommendation. So your REM testing and your output power measurements will typically be found in the manufacturer service manual or the calibration procedure. Your high frequency leakage testing will be recommended by the standard, um, depending on the region. I don't, I'm not sure what standard you'll be using. Normally it's high C60601. Um, REM and power tests will be stated. Um, Commonly in um, they're very specific to each manufacturer, so it's always important that you need to to have a PM procedure for each um, particular model of ESU. Okay, so firstly, we'll take a look at patient return electrodes and how do we ensure their proper function? Um, so why has this technology been developed and, and how does it help mitigate the hazards we were talking about previously? So we know that return electrode is designed to safely remove current from the body. Um, the image shows low and high uh, current densities. Um, the patient plate must cover an optimum amount of skin surface area. Quantity, um, such as shown here, it's got a wide surface area, um, but it must also be high in conductivity, um, which is quality where the, the energy exits the patient. Um, so burns may occur if current density occurs anywhere at the return site electrode. Um, it goes back to the statement before where high current density is where we can um, see more commonly burns. Um, and again, if that patient plate was placed on this side of the body, um, the current might flow like this um, to the, the first point um, and then you'll get even higher density um, current burns. Okay, so REM technology was developed in 1981 to minimise patient injury, um, particularly burn injuries. Um, ESUs constantly measure the impedance between two or more conductive pads within the patient return plate. So essentially another another circuit is formed from the ESU return plate connections. Um, so if we go back to this, this image here, 
um, we'd imagine there's okay so we've already got one circuit which is here but we want there's another circuit um, this this part of the circuit is known as the interrogation current um, so you'll have a an up, within this part you've got another lead that runs um, through to the opposite side of the patient plate um, as shown here and then if that um, if the patient plate is to come away from the skin it's going to measure that difference in impedance um, and the ESU should alarm um, so that, as mentioned here, when specified variations of impedance are detected, the ESU will alarm or deactivate the output uh, energy. Um, patient pads can then be adjusted uh, to prevent burns. Um, so it's a simple solution, um, but it's revolutionary in reducing burn injuries. Um, single plate electrodes are still available. Um, they, are, they do account for, I believe, less than 1% of sales. Um, maybe even less than that, they're, they're constantly being phased out. Um, the, the only place that they're still being used um, is in uh, veterinary centres, um, so veterinary purposes only. Um, but of course, it's led to some debate in the industry um, for consideration of um, animal safety or animal cruelty. Um, but even there, within veterinary centres, they're moving away from that. Um, so limits are stated by the ESU manufacturer, um, typically a check of the low resistance alarm, which is a short circuit plate, typically between 5 and 15 ohms, and then the high resistance alarm, open circuit, um, somewhere in the region of 250 ohms. Um, now traditional testing using an external resistance box for simulation, um, you require high accuracy resistors, 1% you know, or better. It's simple enough to use. Um, but no storage of results, um, and it's purely manually driven. Um, so you do see these in clinical engineering departments um, for testing of REM. Um, I've seen them out in the field. Older electrical, older electrosurgical analyzers, they might not have these REM testing functions. Um, so the testing uh, procedures have to be developed um, after um, REM was considered. So ESU analyzers allow contact quality monitoring systems to be tested automatically and manually. Um, the benefits of e using an ESU analyzer, uh, simulating fault conditions, uh, including very high or very low impedance values or a large variation in impedance. Um, it's got in my own internal motor driven potentiometer. Uh, this can trigger resistant variations to within a one ohm resolution. Um, and it can be um, storage of high and low alarms. Um, so we've got a capture function and we drive the potentiometer up and we can capture when the alarm sounded. And then results can be stored as part of an automatic procedure um, and uploaded um, into your asset management system or wherever your files are stored. Um, one more benefit, which is not mentioned here, is automatic testing um, can often involve automatic test sequences or custom test sequences specific to the manufacturer. Um, and this makes testing much more efficient um, to a user. In case of high frequency leakage, um, design criteria of electrosurgical generators in 60601, um, they require the manufacturer to limit the amount of high frequency um, capacitive leakage and then it's part of the um, performance maintenance schedule so frequencies um, exceeding 400 kilohertz um, electrical current has this tendency to stray and can pass from the active electrode um, to another close conductor through an insulator. Um, the image on the right shows a physical representation on how this results um, in an equivalent circuit. Um, this is known as capacitive coupling um, and it can lead to possible injury to the patient as well as decreased functionality. You've got energy where it's supposed to be, where it's supposed to be applied is now um, traveling elsewhere. Um, now the current in juice depends on proximity, um, voltage levels and degree of insulation levels. 
Um, one thing to note with capacitive coupling, um, particularly when you're carrying out tests um, in your EBME department or your lab, is that coupling can occur between test leads during the setup. Um, and this is why in 60601 you'll find that the layout of the test leads um, ensures that the capacitive coupling is limited and in a controlled way. Um, sometimes you'll find failures are actually just a result of the test lead setup. Um, so it's important to just avoid crossing leads um, and ensuring that test leads are as short as possible. So how does how does it occur in electrosurgery? Um, well, we know that coupling occurs when high frequency energy induces a secondary non-intended current path for a conductive surface. Your conductive materials are not necessarily um, parts of the instrument. Um, so here we've got a metal cannula on the outside of the um, ESU pencil. Um, so the current is flowing um, through this capacitive circuit here. However, even if you didn't have this metal cannula, you might have body tissue here, which acts as a conductor as well. Um, human tissue is conductive um, and it has the potential to produce burns away from your target area. Um, other high frequency influences, uh, implanted medical devices such as pacemakers, you've got endoscopic camera images and in-room viewing cameras. Um, high frequency here can induce interference. Um, and it's a similar case for ECG monitors. Now, ESU circuitry is designed to properly limit the amount of capacitive leakage of high frequency current. Leads and electrodes are common causes of capacitive coupling due to breakdown. Breakdown of insulation during surgery um, leads um, as a result from sort of high voltages. The peak to peak um, is a consideration when testing the electrosurgical generator. Um, a survey on electrosurgical procedures revealed that 18% of burns um, were caused by um, the insulation failure or capacitive coupling. Um, just be aware if you if you are testing with the surgical leads, um, sometimes better to test with the leads to ensure that they're, they're not producing any capacitive coupling as well. Um, that this can lead to um, exposure um, to any of the conductive parts and possible injury. Okay, so the high frequency leakage test measures the, the high frequency leakage current uh, and it's in various test configurations um, and it compares the result to a user set um, pass value and that's if you're using an electrosurgical analyzer. Um, these, these tests are carried out through a non-inductive 200 ohm load. Um, leakage current shall not exceed 150 milliamps or 4.5 watts to ground. Um, so with our ESU analyzer, you've got these high frequency leakage tests on screen um, and it gives you a graphical representation of what's going on on the side panel. Um, so 60601 stipulate many different configurations. You've got um, all the different modes, but plus you might have neutral connected on its own. You might only have the active, load, uh, active electrode connected on its own. You're testing multiple configurations um, to simulate fault conditions in the electrodes and then how well the ESU um, is then shielding the, the result in a leakage. Okay, so power measurements are crucial as well because they um, actual power depends on the tissue impedance. Um, each ESU has got a power distribution curve and that states the uh, peak power under certain or particular impedances. An ESU's output power is controlled for a setting in the equipment panel. Um, ESU is capable um, of producing up to 400 watts. Um, in this case we've got 300 watt but there are 400 watt ESU's um, in surgical environments. Many ESUs have active power management and this monitors and controls the output power and voltage to within the set limits. Um, but not all um, ESUs have this function. Uh, important to note that an ESU with the same dial settings may not produce equivalent 
output powers. Um, a power setting of 10 could mean 10 watts. Um, it could mean 300. I mean, in modern touch color screen ESUs, the wattage value is displayed, um, but this is not always the case. Um, so always refer back to the manufacturer's manual. Okay, so actual output power depends on the tissue impedance of the specified power. Each power setting typically indicates the maximum power that can be delivered. The power distribution curve example um, suggests that the high power is achieved around um, 300 ohms. Um, these power distribution curves um, with numerical details, uh, what can be provided by some automated ESU analyzers. Um, so if you're using our ESU analyzer, if you select the graph test, um, it will give you the option to select the start and end impedance uh, with a various uh, test points. So if you were to select between 0 and 2000 and, and five test points, it's going to do 0, 500, 1000, 1500 and, and 2000. Um, so it gives you that, those tests at those points, but you can do it over a wider variation to get that um, power distribution graph. Um, however, manufacturers typically recommend testing at maximum power peak only, so you might not even be carrying out these tests most of the time, um, although it's not in, uncommon to see um, testing over a wide range of impedance values. So if, if in doubt, always follow the manufacturer's recommendation um, in the service manual. Okay, so me measurement accuracies um, for, for voltage, uh, current and wattage are all important. And these in inaccuracies, they can produce undesirable surgical outcomes. For, for example, excessive energy can result in unnecessary scarring and tissue burns. So peak voltage accuracies are important for correct function. What does that mean? Well, it depends on the application. So coagulation, coagul coagulation requires voltages in the kilovolt range. Um, cutting peak voltages need to be high enough for arcing, but low enough to prevent um, arcing between active electrodes. Um, and then also that prevents the excessive charring. A modern ESU analyzers will measure each, each parameter and provide detailed results um, and calculate these pass fail limits um, automatically. For the benefits of ESUs, each operating mode is tested. Again, much like with high frequency leakage, um, we've got an example of how the test is set up on the side panel with the ESU. So be various configurations um, for the power test you might have you've got cut. Uh, coag um, and any bipolar test as well. Um, now this was traditionally tested um, with uh, various wire wound resistors. Um, it's got limited tests and it's time consuming. Um, any traditional engineers will still remember these. Um, I've seen these out in the field that the wire wound resistors still on the shelf. Um, they still can be used to measure power. Um, but with ESUs, you've got multiple test options such as continuous testing, um, the power graph testing, and also any external load banks that are required. Um, the benefits an ESU may provide as well is that you can control the device under test by using an internal foot switch, um, a controller with a foot switch adapter um, leading to the foot switch connector on the ESU to the cut and coag sockets on the connections. Um, this can help to reduce the overall test time um, and increase user safety. Um, so that's one of the, the key benefits of doing power testing. Um, so it's completely automated. Um, you've got, as well with ESU testing, you've got an internal resistance load bank. Um, so this can be set automatically um, in your automated test procedures. Um, we've got a number of test procedures for an ESU analyzer. Um, you have to use MediBase to upload it onto the, the analyzer itself. Um, we've already got a number of test sequences uh, for different manufacturers and models. Um, very beneficial because the user may only have to switch between, you know, the cut and coag leads during a full power test procedure. Uh, makes things a lot more efficient. Um, that's the last of the, the measurements. I think it's the end of the presentation. Yep, no, that's it. So if anyone's, I've noticed a few questions have been have been coming in. I was going to answer them during the, the presentation, but I didn't want to ruin the flow um, 
the presentation too much um, for anyone that's just viewed. Um, I'll just go through some of those questions now. Okay, I've got one question regarding body impedance, um, which is not cost, which is not constant. Um, that's the current as variable, even if an uh, operator selects certain power. And um, this is quite often why manufacturers will state one specific peak value. So they're only going to get you're only going to get a peak power um, measurement at one specific uh, resistance. Outside of these ranges, um, the power output um, is reduced. OK, is the waveforms of monopolar and bipolar same or different? Um, so bipolar uses a lot less energy. Um, it's converting at the surgical site, so it doesn't need as it certainly uses a lot less power um, than monopolar. OK, I think that's all the questions. Um, I appreciate everyone coming to this webinar today. Um, I hope it's been useful. Um, this. The, the, the slides should be available at the bottom. If they're not, um, just send me a message. I'll, I'll email them over to you. Uh, we've got a second part, which is the uh, Unitherm Electrosurgical Analyzer, um, where we do a bit of a demonstration, how to set things up.